throughout her history, Russia has been largely cut off from the rest of Europe, and this has been particularly so at the revolution of 1917. This film sets out to give some of the facts about present-day Russia. She occupies the greater part of the Eurasian landmass in the Northern Hemisphere. Within her borders there live 200 million people. In this film, we are concerned with the part of Russia west of the Urals known as European Russia. This is a continuation of the North European Plain. Now, this plain is cleared, and wherever possible it's cultivated, but remnants of the once vast forest still remain. In the north, most of the trees are conifers like these. Here are typical deciduous trees in the central region, but as the rainfall decreases towards the south, trees become fewer. In most of European Russia, every peasant is a member of a collective farm. He lives in a small village like this one. Most farmers have a plot of ground on which they work in their spare time. The collective farms often have very modern buildings and equipment. Russian agriculture is progressing from the primitive methods of the past. On the one hand, farmers still dry grain on the sides of the main roads, but on the other hand, combine harvesters like this one are being used. This crop is maize, and it's being cut while unripe to make silage for winter cattle food. The western region of Russia, near the Polish border, is called White Russia. Much of this is a country of lakes and marshes, where ducks and geese and other waterfowl live. The villages are built on the drier parts. The farmers here live in wooden huts. This well-kept church is a sign that religion is tolerated here. Much peat is obtained from the bogs of White Russia. Here's a mechanical excavator at work, though hand labor is also used. This peat is a valuable fertilizer for poor soils. In the south of European Russia is the Republic of the Ukraine. It contains the Black Earth region where the most fertile soil in European Russia is found. This collective farm in the Black Earth region is reasonably well supplied with equipment and buildings and provides work for more than 1,000 people. Mixed farming is practiced here. Flocks of geese are kept on nearby waterways. This particular farm, with all its equipment and livestock, is actually owned by members of the collective farm. Work is planned and allocated from the farm headquarters and agricultural experts, there's one, are attached to the farm. 
Throughout the Ukraine, a great deal of maize is grown. Sunflowers for their seeds and oil, and apples. And this reddish crop is buckwheat, grown as cattle food. With sugar beet, as with most other foodstuffs, Russia makes every effort to be independent of foreign supplies. But the chief crop of the Ukraine is wheat. Great quantities are sent to other parts of Russia and much is exported to Eastern Europe. Many trees too have been planted in the Ukraine to provide wind breaks and to prevent soil erosion, which is a problem in the southern part. The Ukraine is a relatively prosperous part of Russia and substantial cottages are usual here. Modern houses often have painted iron roofs instead of thatch. In the extreme south of European Russia, is a region which enjoys a Mediterranean type of climate. This area includes the Crimean Peninsula and the coast bordering the Black Sea. The limestone in the south of the Crimea forms one of the very few mountainous regions of European Russia. These are an extension of the limestone mountains which occur in Europe. Yalta is one of several small ports on the Black Sea which combine trading and passenger services but they haven't much economic importance. The principal value of the Black Sea coast is a holiday area, and the warm climate is ideal for health resorts. Workers are sent here for holidays or to recuperate from illness. They stay in holiday homes or guest houses run by the Russian trade unions. Russia has no easy access by water to the outside world. The Black Sea is practically landlocked and the northern oceans are frozen for eight months of the year. But many large and slow-moving rivers cross European Russia and canals, which can be easily built across the flat land, link them. So nowadays it's possible to travel the whole distance from north to south of Russia by water and this inland waterway system is of great value. Here's a barge carrying freight on its way through Moscow. Notice the small hut amidships for living quarters. The great rivers of Russia, such as the Dnieper, are used not only for transport but for irrigation and hydroelectric power as well. One of the earliest achievements of the communist regime was the building of the Dnieper Dam in 1938. It provides electricity for a great part of the southern industrial region. These are large irrigation channels on the lower Dnieper, built to assist the problem of water supply in the south. Many of the chief cities of European Russia are on or near the big rivers. Moscow on a tributary of the Volga, Kiev on the Dnieper. Around the Don and the Dnieper are grouped many other important and industrial cities. This is Kharkov, a city of just under a million people. In European Russia today, the standard of living is lower than in most Western countries, but there's no real poverty.
The Soviet five and seven year plans have aimed mainly at the expansion of Russian heavy industry. Here's a mine, not far from Moscow, which produces lignite. One of the main industrial regions of European Russia is centered on Moscow. The second great industrial region is an area in the southeast roughly occupying the basin of the river Don. It's known as the Don Bass. Here's a typical factory on the outskirts of the Don Bass area. This plant produces farm tractors. Factories in Russia are usually larger and more complex than those in the West, and this is because the Russians tend to carry out many different processes in one plant, while in the West, factories usually specialize to a much greater extent. This man is a delegate of the Soviet Parliament. In spite of this, he still has a full-time job. Her red scarf shows that this girl handling a lathe is one of a team of workers who are all Communist Party members. And such a team is expected to set an example to other workers. Although normal methods of stimulating production, such as bonuses and differential wage rates, are widely used today in Russia, psychological incentives such as these propaganda posters are found everywhere. Some show the target figures which each industry is expected to reach or to exceed under the current plan. Workers are encouraged to put in extra effort to exceed their norm and to over-fulfill the plan. Good workers gain special rewards and their portraits are displayed at a public place. This park in Kursk, for instance. Russia is a country with one political party, the Communist Party, and a constant propaganda campaign is carried on on its behalf. The founders of the Communist State are glorified, and on the posters, workers pay tribute to the party. Our way, the way of communism. Theoretically, communism is based on the idea of a universal working class, and statues of workers are set up everywhere in an attempt to keep the communist ideal always before the people. The center of the Russian communist government is Moscow, capital of the USSR and the Russian Socialist Federated Republic. The city is situated on the Moskva River, and it's being rapidly rebuilt in modern style. The large building here is the Lenin Sports Stadium, opened in 1956. Moscow enjoys a rather higher standard of living than the rest of European Russia. Traffic in Moscow is heavy, but most of these cars are for official business rather than private use. At one time, Moscow consisted mostly of wooden buildings. They are steadily being pulled down to make way for new blocks of flats. This is a big new suburb consisting entirely of blocks of flats all built to a similar pattern. The power cranes on the skylines are a familiar sight in most big Russian cities, for an enormous effort is being made to relieve the chronic housing shortage. In the suburbs of Moscow, there are markets, where the produce of the collective farms is sold to the public.
and in the centre there are a few large departmental stores such as the famous GUM. Every year sees an improvement in the range and quality of consumer goods available to the Russian public. The Kremlin was, until recently, the seat of the Russian government. And even now, when it's no longer the closed fortress that it was in Stalin's day, it remains a symbol of the powerful centralized government of the USSR. These pictures are taken inside the Kremlin walls. Today, anyone can enter and visit its cathedrals and palaces. Perhaps this is an indication of a new spirit which seems to be spreading through Russia's political system. A spirit which, we hope, will lead to freer dealings and better relations with the rest of the world.